Congratulations, lucky viewer. We're opening 2006 with the knockout of the year. Calvin Brock caught Zuri Lawrence in the sixth round with a counter left hook that knocked him out cold. It was waved off as he hit the canvas. Good start. Hopefully the year lives up to this, huh? Deja vu. Also, the heavyweights are going to owe Calvin Brock a good debt if he continues this streak of starting off decades with such exciting bouts. After completely whiffing his WBA title win by testing positive for steroids, James Tony once again has an opportunity to join Bob Fitzsimmons and Roy Jones Jr. in the middleweight champs to heavyweight champs club. Haseem Rahman had other plans and pulled off the defense by one round. The final round. The fight was ruled a draw. So close, yet so far. For James. Lights out, Tony. Notable is that Rockman came within 42 punches of matching Ike Ibeabuchi's 975 punch record from his fight with David Tua of New Zealand back in 1997. Looks like both men came up short. The wait is over. The heavyweight titles are finally coming together for the first time in six years. Nah, just kidding. April Fools. In his fourth defense of the WBO title, Lehman Brewster took on Sergei Lyakovic. The challenger was down in the seventh, a move he said was tactical, but ultimately emerged to dethrone Brewster. Brewster claimed he couldn't see out of his left eye after the first round, a fact proven when he underwent surgery for a detached retina after the bout. It's been almost six years since Vladimir Klitschko avenged his older brother Vitaly against Chris Bird. Since then, Bird acquired the IBF title and has reigned since 2002. Now he's got a shot at revenge of his own against Vlad. Dr. Steelhammer himself is making a name for himself in this current run and doubling down over Bird could do wonders in pushing him further toward the top of the mountain, especially with his brother being retired. Vlad is all that stands for the Klitschko family name. The first match went the distance. This one did not. Vlad executed Manny Stewart's game plan flawlessly and Bird never got past the Steelhammer's left. He dropped Bird in the 5th and 7th, the fight being stopped after Bird rose from that knockdown. The beating Bird endured after the 5th round knockdown earned him high marks for his heart, marks similar to those of his cousin Lehman Brewster. Bird was defiant, begging Klitschko for more during that 5th round beatdown. The referee definitely extended Bird the benefit of champion's advantage by not stopping the fight during the unanswered barrage. Maybe the beating Bird was enduring was karma for the boring affair he had in his last title defense. Just like that, Vlad has earned his first highly regarded world title and is the new IBF champion. He's also the new IBO titleist and despite the fact that it remains a non-major sanctioning body as of June 2024, I'm mentioning it in the event that the IBO does ascend to become the fifth major sanctioning body. No joke, the IBO title will be tied to the IBF title from here on in heavyweight history. No, seriously, again, as of June of 2024, the current IBF titleist Oleksandr Usyk also holds the IBO title, and so has every other IBF titleist between he and Vlad. While I'm on this tangent, this connection between the IBF and IBO goes back to 1999 when Lennox Lewis beat Evander Holyfield. Before that, it belonged to Brian Nielsen and was outside of the major title picture. Someone remind me to mention in a future edition of this series if the IBO title ever separates from the IBF connection. Hell, maybe I should just make an IBO lineage video and discuss other lesser sanctioning bodies. I anyway, I'm way off topic. I shall finally digress. I gotta say, Vlad looked like the Vlad we know in historical context for the first time in this fight, at least to me. 
just completely in control and a surgeon. He's even got the haircut you see in your head when you think Vladimir Klitschko. The steel hammer credited Bird and his family for being good people after the bout. Bird retreated to his wife to decide whether he'd continue fighting. His face was a mess at fight's end. The bridge between the black and white era and the modern era left us on May 11th. He fought men who were active in the 30s and 40s and fought in the 50s, 60s, and 70s himself against guys who would go on to be active afterward. Floyd Patterson passed due to complications of Alzheimer's disease and prostate cancer. Patterson, before Mike Tyson, was the youngest heavyweight champion in history. Speaking from the undisputed standpoint, he technically still is. Patterson bested Archie Moore to achieve said status. He was also the first heavyweight to ever reclaim the title, a feat he achieved against Ingemar Johansson. His polite demeanor and being a gentleman were counter to what was thought of the heavyweight champion. Still, even amidst the racist times, he was loved by the people. This was no more apparent than when Sonny Liston thrashed him twice. If you'd like to check out Patterson's career, you can do so in the 50s, 60s, and 70s timelines. The 50s timeline isn't up yet as of me making this, but it'll be available in the linked playlist with the rest soon. You can click or tap the bubble in the top right or scroll to the bottom of the description for the linked content. Rest in peace to the heavyweight champ who, despite his struggles, proved that it wasn't ever truly over until it was over. Maybe he should have been in this decade. Shannon Briggs tipping the scales at a mighty 273 pounds, won a third round stoppage over Chris Koval. We haven't seen the cannon since he beat Ray Mercer back in 2005, but just know that he was now on an 11 fight win streak. No one made it to the final bell against the cannon. Yeah, this run is legit. It's about to pay off too because he has a big opportunity in his next fight. In his first title defense, Nikolai Valuev made short work of Owen Beck. He dropped the challenger once in the second and third respectively. Beck was met with a barrage after rising in the third and the fight was stopped. Good first defense. For his second defense of the WBC title, Haseem Rockman sought to avenge his embarrassing loss to Olog Maskev seven years earlier. At this point in the title picture, Rockman was the last American titleist, and the fight was billed as such. Despite allegedly unfair warnings for holding giving to Maskev, he pulled it off in the final round and stopped the champion. In said round, a knockdown was followed by Rachman struggling to hold on and eating a flurry from the challenger. And just like that, we've got a new title holder. I'm sure Americans would have preferred a better last line of defense. Uh, no offense, I see. It had been almost two years since he last fought. It had been four years since he'd won a fight and it had been nine years since he scored a knockout, but Evander Holyfield broke all three of those marks with a second round stoppage of Jeremy Bates. Calvin Brock pursued the IBF title under Vladimir Klitschko, and this opened up a spot in the top 15 WBC rankings for the real deal. I guess it ain't over till it's over. We got a big time WBC eliminator on our hands. It had been two years since Sam Peter had tested the professional merit of the do-or-die Vladimir Klitschko. He came up short. Tonight, the NABF titleist is up against a would-be heavyweight title holder in the former middleweight champion, James Lights Out Tony. Tony's heavyweight story was rife with controversy, but maybe he could turn it around here. Peter came in at 257, the heaviest he'd been since the Klitschko fight. Over 12 rounds, Tony landed the cleaner blows, but Peter landed the harder blows. CompuBox showed that Tony overall outlanded Peter, but it was the Nigerian Nightmare who received the split decision. To this day, 
Many consider this a true win for Tony and believe he should have gone on to fight for the WBC title. A rematch was ordered. In his second defense of the WBA title, Nikolai Valuev scored the TKO in the 11th. Both men were wobbled in the first and Barrett was down in the 8th. Valuev would drop Barrett three times in the 11th and the challenger answered each time. Unfortunately for Monty Barrett, his corner stopped the fight. Look, it's always safe rather than sorry. If the challenger endured any more punishment, who knows what would have happened and what I'd be documenting. Shannon Briggs vacated the three lesser titles he held to pursue this opportunity against WBO titleist Sergei Lyakovich. It was the right move, too, because Briggs' run he'd been on peaked here with the victory. Making it even more impressive was that Briggs scored the TKO with just one second to go in the fight. He was trailing, too. What a turnaround. Briggs knocked the champ down, he rose, and Briggs proceeded to knock him out of the ring. If Lyakovich had answered the 22nd count or been allowed to continue after, he would have retained the title. Now the cannon's resume holds the WBO title. Good legacy booster. Evander Holyfield returned three months later and scored a decision win over Fress Akendo despite being outlanded. The win earned him placement in all four sanctioning bodies rankings. Akendo said he suffered from strep throat before the bout and that it took a real toll on him. Holyfield was billing his comeback as the final chapter. Nothing too exciting here, let's move on. Vladimir Klitschko's first defense of the IBF title was supposed to be against Shannon the Cannon Briggs, but as you just saw, he elected to chase the WBO title and he won it. In his place on Vlad's plate is undefeated Calvin Brock. Can he derail Klitschko, or are those days truly behind the champ? Klitschko dropped Brock with a straight right in the seventh round. The challenger answered and was immediately waved off. Yeah, the losses look like they're truly behind Vlad. Still, we'll see, I suppose. As for Brock, we can still thank him for the exciting beginnings to 2005 and 2006. Glad he got a shot at the title. Brock would return in 2007. For John Ruiz, this fight was to be a statement toward Nikolai Voluev that the WBA title still belonged to the quiet man and that the decision was unfair. Perhaps his mind was too much on that as Ruslan Chagev, being relatively inexperienced, managed the split decision against the former title holder in this WBA title eliminator. Ruiz had a new trainer and said he was becoming a new fighter. Whether he looked different or not, I'll leave to you. This fight is so unimportant in the grand scheme of things that I couldn't even find a full upload. Just dreadful, apparently. However, it is Ruslan Chagev's timeline debut and he has ascended to 22-0 with one draw. 28 years young. Man, anything is possible. In his first WBC title defense, Olog Maskev dropped Peter Raquello in the 10th round en route to a 12-round unanimous decision. The fight took place a day after Maskev received his Russian citizenship. I have to mention that it's insane how a title fight from the year 2006 doesn't have an official broadcast version on YouTube to view. Perhaps very telling of how shitty the title scene was at the time. Ugh. It's been 16 years since Rocky V left a shaky mark on the otherwise perfect Rocky franchise. Sylvester Stallone has been open about how much he dislikes the franchise's fifth installment, and I'm sure you can see how that made this particular production personal. The ultimate makeup to redeem the franchise by ending it properly. Enter Rocky VI. Wait, it's not called Rocky VI? Why not? It's called Rocky Balboa? Why? Why ruin the perfect symmetry that was the Roman numerical titling? Well, apparently it's because so much time had passed since Rocky V that it was felt this one stood on its own. There's also the case of the parody musical called Rocky VI from the 80s. 
that was titled as such to parody Rocky IV at the time by reversing the I and the V. It was also because it was meant to be the final send-off for the character, and adding Rocky's last name epitomized that. Stallone stated this point, in fact, even with the Creed films coming later, that explanation stands as it was the end of Rocky being the centerpiece of the saga. In a way, it was a reboot of the franchise, and a good deal of time before that became popular. It had been 30 years since the release of the original film, after all. Bill Conti returned to compose the score. Stallone initially wanted Roy Jones Jr. to play the role of the antagonist, Mason the Lion Dixon, but RJJ never returned his calls. Thus, Antonio Tarver was pinged for the role. Speaking of the cast, most of the OGs returned. Even more obscure ones like Pedro Lavelle as Spider Rico. Stu Nahan, a ringside announcer from the first four films, commentates the CGI fight for ESPN. He passed away a year later, rest in peace. Many real-life personalities appeared throughout the film. There is one character who does not return, and it affects the film big time. We'll address that in the summary. So, what's up with this one? Can Stallone do the impossible and end Rocky's story on a high note? His track record says yes, but the sting of Rocky V cast out. Rocky Balboa opens with an interesting visual of the events to come in the film through the lens of the Rocky title card. Mason Dixon is established as the heavyweight champion of the era, but his heart and merit as a champion are called into question by the boxing world. We're brought back to the original setting with the Frank Stallone, take you back, do 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 do, take you back, jingle. There couldn't have been a better return. Rocky is now 60 years old and living a quiet life as a restaurant owner. The establishment is named after his late wife, Adrian. Yeah, you heard that right. Adrian passed away off screen and you really feel Rocky's grief because we knew and loved her too. It was a brilliant decision in hindsight and this is the character I mentioned earlier who didn't return. Rocky's battles include the grief of having lost Adrian in a strained relationship with his now adult son who is no longer played by Sage Stallone. Paulie is guilt-ridden over how he treated Adrian and hates how Rocky is living backwards. The movie further tugs at your heartstrings with flashbacks to wholesome moments from earlier in the franchise, like Rocky and Adrian's first date. When Rocky says that he has that beast inside of him that's eating away at him, you can really feel it. For us fans, that beast is probably more so the fallout of Rocky V. Another OG returns in Little Marie, yeah, the teenage girl from the first film who said screw you creepo, to Rocky, has become a mature mother. Of course, a reveal like this makes the work print of Rocky V non-canon, given she's in that with a trash life. I digress. Rocky and Marie even joke about that moment from the original film and Rocky meets her son. Mason Dixon, burdened by the deep cutting criticism, seeks advice from his old trainer who brought him up. A fictional program akin to my own Boxing What If series catches the eye of all the characters. It showcases a CGI rendition of Rocky vs. Mason, and Rocky wins. As mentioned in the 70s timeline, this was inspired by the super fight between Muhammad Ali and Rocky Marciano, and the movie directly references it. This coupled with the predictions of some analysts is the last straw for both Balboa and Dixon. See, Rocky catches it too and hears how some analysts think he was overrated. Some familiar beats are hit from the original film, like Rocky's awkward charm wearing away at Marie as it did to Adrian 30 years earlier. Speaking of which, the film has an unspoken degree of there being a mild romantic flair between Rocky and Marie. I never noticed this until someone brought it up years afterward. Is it creepy? Remember Rocky asking her if she had a boyfriend in the first film? Kinda puts it in a new light, huh? Of course not. No. I'm just kidding. Let's not make something out of nothing here. It's all good. To adults. Rocky gets a dog that everyone thinks is ugly, old, and probably dead. Balboa can see more, however, and it's clear the dog is a metaphor for how he sees himself as still having some mileage in him. It's also a reminder of how he was the only one who could see the beauty in Adrian back in the day. The dog's name is Punchy. Very telling. Side note, 
We see Pauly painting a portrait in the meat factory, and yes, it's the same meat factory. Could it be that Pauly painted the portrait of Rocky and Apollo from Rocky 3? He even stands in front of it while holding his own portraits after he's fired from the meat plant. I'm just spitballing here. Rocky determines to start training again in effort to fight, and of course, everyone thinks he's nuts. Rocky seeks a boxing license again from the Pennsylvania State Athletic Commission and is denied on the basis of his age. He gives a passionate rebuttal speech about unfinished business and being unjustly denied. He secures his license. Before we move on, it's said Rocky passes all his physical tests. So Rocky V isn't canon? It has to be canon because Rocky is back in Philly without his fortune. Well, according to Stallone, Rocky was misdiagnosed back in Rocky V and never sought a second opinion. Well, that sucks. Rocky really could have fought Union Kane back then and regained his life back. Big bummer in hindsight. Mason's team convinces him to fight Balboa as a means of recovering the champ's image. Rocky convinces Marie to work at his restaurant as they continue growing closer. Dixon's team visits the restaurant and offers Rocky an exhibition with the champ. Marie convinces Rocky that he's on the right path and he goes through with it. As Robert attempts to talk Rocky out of fighting on the back of living in his father's shadow, Rocky comes back with probably the most motivational speech in history. It ain't about how hard you hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Robert quits his job with the abusive boss and joins his father's efforts. Duke returns to train Rocky for the fight and hasn't missed a beat. The obligatory training montage ensues and it too has not missed a beat in the years the franchise has been dormant. Rocky even drinks eggs and hits the slabs of meat again. It ends with him climbing those same steps where it all began and in the snow this time at that. Bit of a fusion of Rocky 1, 2, and 4. At the pre-fight, Mason pulls Rocky aside and tells him he'll take care of him. But if Rocky goes off script and hurts him, he'll get him out of there. Rocky doesn't back down. Marie visits Rocky to give him a picture of Adrian to keep him safe and gives him a kiss. The HBO coverage of the fight does well to make this all feel like a real pay-per-view from the 2000s. Mason gets into it with Mike Tyson at ringside before the bout. Good to see the recently retired Iron Mike. As for the fight, it's awesome. Michael Buffer's announcing really gets you pumped and ready. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! If old George Foreman shocked the world with one punch, why can't old Rocky Balboa? Despite being outclassed, Rocky continues to take it to the champ. His training for power pays its dividends as Mason reflects on Rocky having bricks in his gloves. Dixon tastes the canvas after an assault from Rocky on the back of the champ breaking his hand. The montage of the fight feels like a fusion of one from Rocky 2 and 3 with Rocky 4. Maybe the fight is as good as it is because they got some real hits in there. I think Tarver actually knocks Stallone out during the filming. We even get some flashback images of Adrian at ringside and Mickey in Rocky's corner. Rocky makes it to the final round against all odds, again. He survives a knockdown that, now that I'm paying attention to, reminds me of the revision to Rocky IV he made in the director's cut where he tells himself to breathe while down. He rises to trade with the champ and wins the final exchange. In the end, the beast has been exercised for both men. Rocky has finished his business and Mason has bounced back. Mason wins by split decision just as Apollo did 30 years earlier. However, again, the result is irrelevant. It was about going the distance one last time and putting all demons to rest. Rocky visits Adrian's grave to give her the good news and tell her, Yo, Adrian, we did it. Rocky walks off out of focus in the background from the flowers on the grave and fades out. The character has been given his flowers and properly retired. The beast of Rocky V has been laid to rest. The credits include fans climbing the Rocky steps, something Stallone included by request. I'd like to say that this one is very special to me personally. 
Back in 2006, a nine-year-old boy was a huge fan of Rocky. He'd seen the first five films and was blown away by the news that he would get to see a Rocky film in the theater. He begged his parents to get him all five films on DVD so he could binge watch them at will and not just when they came on TV. That same boy had been mystified by Rocky IV at his grandma's house as was mentioned in the 80s timeline. Of course, the boy is me. I remember going to see Rocky Balboa after watching all five films beforehand. I was fortunate to be on Christmas break at the time, so no homework or school night to screw me out of my destiny. We went to the theater as a family, and it was awesome. My parents enjoyed the nostalgia that came from the callbacks, but also embraced how well the movie stood on its own. So did I. I remember the sound booming in the theater and the movie looking so new and crisp in comparison to the first five. Everything was on point. It was my moment to enjoy a great franchise I would have been otherwise born too late to enjoy on the big screen. As soon as the movie hit home media, we picked up the DVD and I still have that copy some 17 years later. It wasn't the sequel we necessarily needed or even deserved, but Damn am I proud of Sly for putting a last dance together for his magnum opus. It was the perfect send-off, and the existence of the Creed spin-offs somehow doesn't diminish it. In fact, they add to it. Rocky Balboa did the impossible and knocked everything out of the park. 16 years well worth the wait, and the cloud of Rocky V has been banished. Though again, I will say that the work print of Rocky V may be on par with the rest of the franchise. Give it a watch. As far as Rocky Balboa goes, it truly ain't over till it's over. You should be used to hearing that by now. The 2000s seems to bleed and breathe this. K6 is in the books. Here are Ring Magazine's top 10 heavyweights. The heavyweight of destiny finally picked up another title. That's a step in the right direction. The rest of the title is a mess and Vitaly is still gone. But maybe that void can be filled. Ruslan Chagev was close for me, but I've got to give it to Shannon Briggs, winning the WBO title at the very last second. That's our upset of the year. Nikolai Valuev dropping Monty Barrett three times in their 11th round was close, but I'm giving round of the year to Shannon Briggs knocking his man out of the ring for the WBO title. The fight of the year honor is going to Vladimir Klitschko's domination over Chris Bird in their rematch in which he, arguably, first looked to be the Dr. Steelhammer history knows. I love a good story as much as the next guy, and Shannon Briggs almost got it, but I've got to give the Fighter of the Year honor to Vladimir Klitschko. First he doubles down on Chris Bird to reclaim a title convincingly, and then he blasts the guy who earlier scored the knockout of the year. Jeez, how many is that now for Dr. Steelhammer? You been keeping count? On February 20th, Fight Night Round 3, released on PS2, Xbox, Xbox 360, and PlayStation Portable. The PS3 version came later on December 5th. This one is special to me as it was my first game in the series and acted as one of those markers in my youth that ultimately got me into boxing. I still fire this one up every now and then. David Price, the touted future of the heavyweight division for British fight fans, scored an amateur rank victory over young Tyson Fury. This was in spite of Fury dropping Price because of how amateur boxing is scored. Clean punches are what matter. Remember this event because there's going to be a hilarious Fury promo to come down the line. Price and Fury would spend their early careers verbally challenging one another. I want to say it's all about the same, but Vladimir Klitschko holding a title gives me hope. I've got a good feeling about 2007, I don't know. All in my gut. Let's hope all the best for Dr. Steelhammer, because the heavyweight division is in desperate need of a face. It's been almost three years since we lost the lion. Who will be the new King of the Jungle?